All right, well, so hi, everybody. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and it's time for the Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, uh, April 19th, 2013. And so today, uh, you know what? Actually, we've got, like, two of possibly the biggest stories we've had in a long time. So it's, I'm certain I was thinking about that as we were just getting ready for the show. That actually, two massive stories happened in the last... Uh, like weeks. So we'll, we'll get into it. Uh, so the first one we're going to talk about is the Kepler discovery of two potentially habitable worlds uh, and the possibility that dark matter has been discovered. So like done. We could just Again. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, right. But also uh, a cool story about how uh, the first Soviet rover might have been discovered on Mars. Uh, dead. <laughs> and uh, NASA's plans to capture an asteroid, which is also big news. Uh, and then also we're going to give get an update on uh, what the president is the pres the pre the president the president is planning for his uh, for his proposed budget. So uh, we've got that. Uh, we're going to round up those stories. So joining me today, we've got uh, we've got Amy Sure title. Hello. We've got uh, the new person joining us, which is Doctor Matthew Francis, and uh, AKA. The, but the, are you the bowler hat scientist? Uh, I guess you could call me that. Sure, why not? Well, that is your domain name. That is what you're wearing right now. So this is it. This is your first weekly space hangout. Your nickname nope. here was second. Second. We'll stick with second. you forever. You weren't here, Fraser. I wasn't here. No, no. Uh, so this is that's it. Bowler hat scientist. That's it. It's done. It's stuck. So um, cool. It's, it's great to meet sort of in the show for the first time. So um, and so we've also got in one place to see that they're actually. <laughs> Different people. We are uh, different Scott, people. Scott Lewis and Nicole Gallucci. W where are you guys? Where's we're in my office? Where? <laughs> in my house. You're in Edwards. We're in Edwardsville. We're You're in my in Edwardsville. house. Yeah. My yeah. Curtis. Um. Yeah. It's cold. <laughs> I miss Southern California. It's like you know. <laughs> yeah, I sure enjoyed that weather. I gotta say. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was 26 Celsius the other day, and now it's five. Well, well, well. He's like, bug me to put the heat on. I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible hostess. <laughs> so how long, how long are you there for, Scott? I'll be here until Sunday morning. I'll be flying back on Sunday. That is really cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. thanks for hosting him. Um, okay, so we're going to be talking about... Let's, first, let's start with the Kepler discovery of two potentially habitable planets. Who Who is taking that one? Um, that I think uniform? I was going to start yeah. on that. <clears throat> Right, so uh, as much as I've complained in the past that, oh my god, all we ever hear is how all these planets are habitable and another habitable, another Earth-like, another Earth-like, and everyone's like, well, which one's really the Earth-like one? Well, this one, this one's actually a really exciting discovery. We have uh, seen a solar system around the star called Kepler-62, uh, which means it's somewhere in Kepler's catalog of stars. It's not, you know, well-known from any other catalog. Um... It's a little bit cooler, a little bit smaller than the sun, and it has five planets. Um, so it has five planets uh, that have been discovered orbiting it, and this is, of course, an artist's conception of what those planets right. might look like because this they is a photograph of yeah. them yeah, seen from our space the probe. Kepler space probe. Um, <laughs> but uh, Kepler 62e and 62f are were both found with the transiting method, so that means that one that the planets are crossing in front of the disk of the uh, of the star. Um, and so we see a dimming in the light of the star. All we can tell from that right now is the radius of the planets. And so one of them is about 1.4 times the radius of the Earth. One of them is 1.6 times the radius of the Earth. We don't have a mass estimate. We have no idea about composition. We do know that they're close to the Earth in size and that they're in the habitable zone around the star. And so that means it's, it's in that Goldilocks zone where liquid water may be able to exist. Uh, it's a very exciting discovery, not much is known at this time, but if you compare it to the other super-Earths that have been found, um, <clears throat> it's likely that they will be rocky in composition as well, even though we don't have that data yet. So this is um, an exciting its an exciting discovery. It's not, oh my gosh, we've contacted life or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> but um, it, is, it is telling us that now what we know from Kepler's discovery so far is we are seeing... Um, we are seeing more and more planets, and we are can make an estimate that there are several billions of planets in the Milky Way galaxy alone. And so, there, there's uh, if we're detecting these planets, then that means there's probably or most likely a large, much larger population out there of these super Earth um, like planets. So it's exciting. Oh yeah, here we go. This is the uh, size estimates of the planets. Um, 
the one that there's one that's really small, even Mercury size, but that one's not in the habitable zone around the star. Um, that's that's way too close. Now, um, 62E is a bit closer to its star. It's a bit warmer than the sun than the Earth is going around the sun. Um, 62F is a bit cooler than you know we might possibly want it to be. Um, but anyway, they're they're interesting. They're you know they're a little too hot, a little too cold, but it's uh, it's an interesting discovery. We haven't found our Earth duplicate yet. Um, yet. 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 <laughs> but, right. I mean, look at this. Uh, I know I'm a, just a disembodied voice right now, but but if you look at the at uh, at our solar system, you see right Venus, Earth, and Mars are all in the habitable zone. And as we know, yeah. Venus and Mars are no place you'd want to live. It's debatable, um, and, and the habitable zone changes over the lifetime of the star. Right. It heats up uh, throughout its lifetime. And you can see, and th this current graphic is also good for showing you that the habitable zone of this six, uh, Kepler-62 system is quite a bit smaller because it's a cooler star. Uh, its habitable zone is going to be smaller in area and actually closer in to the star. I seem to remember there was an estimate that the system is older than ours by a couple billion years. Is, oh, I didn't does anybody see that. remember that? I seem to recall seeing that it, that they're estimating something like seven billion years, and of course, it is a cooler star, so it can go uh, even longer. Right, it could be it could it could be a much more slowly evolving system, or mm -hmm. you know, it's we, all bets are off, really, right? We don't we only have one system where we know all this stuff, so we're we're, we're learning this stuff as we go, really, which is kind of cool. Yep. And, and so, uh, what what are the implications of having that super Earth? You know, I mean, is it, you know, it's going to be heavier gravity? You're going to have, if it does have life, you're going to have a bunch of, I don't know. Gravity's not going to be heavier. There's Everything's going to be a little bit better. better. It's going to be a little bit better, a little bit sweeter. Okay, yeah. semantics, yes. Things, <laughs> yes, it's gravitational pull will be stronger on, on whatever. Yeah, so, you, yeah, you're going to have some, like, super mammoth with super dense bones, you know, running right. around the surface. Is it the Elcor, right? Right, 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 from Mass Effect. But you don't get... Um, I mean, for when I was, you know, when you take the gravity, I mean, this, the, the planet is going to have a lot more mass, but it's also going to be larger, and so the actual force of gravity on the surface of the planet isn't going to be... It's about you know, 1.4, I yeah. don't remember. It, it is a little bit more than, than yeah. one Earth gravity, yeah. but so it's, it's not, heavier. not more, yeah. right, because the mass and the radius come into effect. The other, I mean, interesting thing is we're going to be seeing more and more of these smaller planets now that Kepler's been around for several years, because... In these habitable zone orbits, you only see it once, you know, about a year, um, and so in order to see multiple multiple transits and be sure it's not a star spot, it's not some other kind of weird phenomenon, um, right. that it is indeed a planet. And so in order to be repeatable, we've had to wait this long uh, to confirm. Right. I mean, that's the real, I mean, people's impatience, right, is that you need that, you know, these planets, they're going to be small, they're going to be hard to detect, you're going to need to make a lot of observations, and if you're looking for a world that's going to be in that same orbit, as the Earth, you're looking at a year per orbit, and you're going to need multiple orbits to con confirm. And so we're really only a few years into Kepler's mission anyway. So it's you know the the all the really great discoveries are still in the are still in the database somewhere, waiting mm -hmm. for that those third and fourth confirmations. Before and then of course really you need you need ground based uh, follow up as well to to actually glean some more information about the planets if you can, something about their mass or something about their composition. So, so because you know what's interesting. I mean, this is we've been doing the weekly space hangout now for about a year and a couple of months now, yep. and the sort of the very first experiment that we did on Google Plus was when there was an Earth-sized world <laughs> discovered, but it wasn't. I think it wasn't. This was about a about a year and a quarter ago or so, and so we we mentioned in that show that that we would hit that holy grail that we would end up with an Earth-sized world in the planet's habitable zone some time in the next couple of years. And so we're still kind of inching towards that that big discovery. We haven't made the big one yet, the Earth twin. Right. But even even if we find Earth's twin, there's no guarantee it's habitable. Right? We can all we can say is it's in the habitable zone. It's likely habitable. I think that's what we're saying about these these planets as well. So um, yeah, yeah, wanted to take on the composition of of what's on it, even though it's very similar in, in, in mass and radius and its its orbital period could be close to it. The composition plays a lot into what's going on there, as far as you know, dealing with any sort of atmosphere. Just you know, the chemical compositions plus anything else around it really will play an effect on what's going on in that system. 
Now, do we have any technology that, you know, if one, if one of these worlds, you know, do we have any way that we can actually confirm whether or not the world is habitable? Any way to get a sense of these, if these planets have water or even if they have some kind of, you know, oxygen in their atmosphere or pollution? I mean, do we have any, any way, I mean, radio waves, spectroscopy? Oxygen in the atmosphere could be an indicator that um, respiration is going on, but there's oxygen in other environments too, so that even wouldn't be a telltale sign. So, but but we don't even have a way that we could even detect it right now. Well, that's we a yes, yes or no. It you you kind of have to get the edge of the atmosphere when you're. Pardon me, I always talk with my hands. I'll do use my hat. No, no, you, you have, have when you have the when you have the edge of when you're seeing the edge of the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so if I think of my face as the star. Okay, and here's <laughs> the planet. Right okay, so when it so you're see when you're seeing the edge of the planet, the the star's light shining through the atmosphere, sometimes you can pick up a little bit of the chemical composition. But we've only got that for a small handful of exoplanets. It's, but, it's not easy to do. We've never, we haven't done atmo have we, We've done water, though. We've found water, haven't we, in atmospheres on exoplanets? I'm not sure. I think but we have. The thing about the Kepler discoveries is they are all transits by nature, and therefore right. there, is an, there is an opportunity to see the atmosphere um, in that transit. Now, of course, an Earth, an, an Earth, a smaller Earth-like or super Earth-like planet um, is probably it, 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 something that's habitable. The way we think of it as habitable is probably going to have a thin atmosphere. The Earth has a really thin atmosphere compared to the size of the planet. It's not like Jupiter, where it's all atmosphere. Um, so it may even be be harder to detect. I think what's actually going on in the atmosphere because it's so much thinner. Yeah, I believe all of the the exoplanets where we have any kind of atmosphere chemistry, it's for super Jupiters, planets that are bigger than Jupiter and are orbiting closer than uh, Mercury orbits to the Sun. I believe those are the only ones we've got any kind of uh, um, atmosphere for so far, just because it's easier. I, I want to address some of the comments we're seeing. Um, uh, Tom Nath asks us, how much longer will Kepler mission be going? I did a quick Google search, and uh, I, I remember hearing that it had been extended, but wasn't sure how long, and it's been approved for extension through 2016. So that's a good number of, of, of years more of data that can be collected on these. Um, uh, Andrew Kornblatt asks, or mentions, if we find a habitable-like planet, there's still a large chance it may not exist. Um, that's not necessarily true. It wouldn't be trillions of light years away. Things that we're discovering with these telescopes are not that far on, not that far away on a cosmic distance scale. We're talking millions of light years away, and millions of light years away are sorry, not even millions of light years away, but within you know thousands to hundreds of light years away, um, hundreds. which, is, which yeah. is a tiny, tiny fraction of of a stellar lifetime. And so the things that are close enough for us to see wouldn't have necessarily gone through that evolution phase. Uh, and Craig Landon, thank you for asking this, can Alma pinpoint atmospheric composition? Uh, not necessarily. I think Alma's better at looking at systems where planets are forming. Alma sees the emission lines, um, not so much absorption because uh, in front of a star the way you can in optical. So planet formation? Um, oh my Walter, got you. <laughs> uh, Walter Wong makes a good point, right? It's kind of confusing with the term habitable. Is it habitable to human or bacteria? Like a thermophile could survive at high temperature. And I think that's a really good point. It depends yeah. on, on yeah, what, what you consider exciting. I think finding microbes would be awesome. Yes, if we find planet tardigrade. That's all that's there. <laughs> yeah. That would yeah, be awesome. Water fairs and their watery <laughs> paradise. Uh, but you can, you know, I mean, I think the point, I mean, the the definition, if I understand, is that it's just that water can exist in a liquid form within that within that zone, and you know, whatever you're going to get with that is is what you get. It's a very Earth-centric term that we're using, and we... Yeah. yeah. Well, and, well, and we kind of have to, because that's what we base all life that we know in the universe is off of Earth, so we do have to go with what we know, and I mean, that's the... the you know, the best way we understand about the different stars is we have this one really, really close to us, so we can study it as much as we can to help better understand what else is around us. So I, when it comes to discovering the, the other planets, we have to go with what we know, because we don't uh, have any other examples. Uh, I see a Katu on YouTube notes that planet Tardigrade would be the cutest planet in the universe. Oh like, it would. It would. Yeah, just a water bear paradise. Uh, okay, well, let's move on to a to the other big story, which is uh, the potential discovery of dark matter, and at that point, I'll put a whole bunch of exclamation points and uh, you know, and a whole bunch of aside. So, so uh, Dr. Francis, can you give us sort of the update on uh, on this discovery? Okay. Well, first of all, um, 
I, I'm as excited about this as as well. Okay, I. The first reaction should always be skepticism, and so I'll I'll, I'll pour the cold water, and then we'll pour the the uh, the whiskey over the top of the cold water. But uh, the the point the point is that okay. So first of all, this was this is a discovery at uh, at the cryogenic dark matter search, so CDMS, and this is located at the bottom of an of a defunct iron mine in northern Minnesota. And I've actually been there. I went there as as uh, for research for a book I'm writing. Oh, so it's a really cool place. What was that? Did you actually go down the shaft and Yes. Oh, that's so cool. You have to you have to ride the old uh the old uh, uh carriages down to the bottom of the mine. So it's about, you know, a ten minute descent in near total darkness. It's it's really fun. Um and this is something anybody can do, by the way. You don't have to you don't have to be wearing a, a bowler hat to do it. But it's <laughs> uh it's uh but the CDMS is, as the name suggests, kept very cold. It's cooled with liquid helium. And unlike most of the other dark matter experiments, it uses solid crystals. It uses uh, silicon and germanium crystals. And the idea is that when a dark matter particle hits a nucleus of, of an atom, it sets up little sound waves inside these crystals, which translate to electrical signals, which then are, well, let's put it this way. A lot of things can create these sound waves. A lot of things can create electrical signals. And so what they're doing is they're looking for, there we go, there's a great picture. Um, they're looking for uh, uh, things that don't correspond to other particles hitting the crystals or setting up these sound waves. And so as a result, this is uh, really tricky to make sure that we're that we're not detecting something that isn't actually dark matter and so uh what they what they announced last week at the american physical so society april meeting is that um they found three particles that don't seem to correspond to the background uh are they dark matter are they not well that's a good question it's it's not a certain thing um but you know let's be hopeful about it let's this, this is a week where we need all the hope we can get it looks good it looks positive so we'll see um there it's what's called a three sigma detection which means it's 99.7 percent possible but when you've but but that but that's actually not the right way to think about it think of it this way if you've got a thousand events a thousand particles you're going to get just by random chance, three detections that look like they're dark matter. Okay, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing three particles that look like dark matter. Are they dark matter? Are they not? We got to do more. So, I mean, if, if, you know, to give people a bit of a background, right? I mean, dark matter is this mysterious matter that's filling the universe and and has this, you know, this extra mass that is also, you know, seems to be clustered around galaxies. And, and through gravitational lensing, I know that astronomers have actually seen where the dark matter is is composed in the universe. And you can actually see how two galaxies can, can crash into each other and the, the gas will collide in the middle, the stars will pass through each other, and the dark matter also passes through each other. So it's got this, you know, it doesn't have a cross section, right? And so what, you know, I mean, I guess the question with, with this, this, I guess with this observatory, with these experiments, what characteristics are they looking for that kind of matches then what we see out in, in the universe? I mean, how do they know that the things they're finding in these detectors are the things that are out there in space, you know, that they're detecting with gravitational lensing? And of course, that's the, that's the trick, right? We're, what we're doing is we're looking at two different aspects of the same thing. And specifically what CDMS and other dark matter detectors are primarily looking for are particles. It's, it's not a specific particle so much as it's a particle type called a WIMP for weakly interacting massive particle, um, which is just one of several goofy acronyms we've got in, in cosmology. But, uh, uh, but the idea is that it, it interacts via the weak force, which is actually the technical name for it. There's some lame names too. Um, but the weak force you know, is, is one, of, one of the four fundamental forces of nature. And so uh, particles, 
a lot of particles interact with the weak force. And the idea is that, okay, maybe dark matter does too. Um, there's no guarantee that it does. We see it through its gravitational effects, but it would be nice if it did correspond, uh, interact via the weak force. And there's a lot of theoretical reason to think that that's true. Well, so basically, the weak force, it's much stronger than gravity. And it's, yes. It's, you know, weak is a pretty poor name when you're comparing it to what we really interact as humans all the time with gravity. Weak is much stronger than, than gravity really is. It is. It is. So we, the, but, but the nice thing, though, is that you know, because it's so much stronger than gravity, if a wimp hits an atom, if it gets a square hit on a nucleus, um, maybe we'll see a signal from it. And so that's really, again, there's theoretical reason to think that that's the case, not just wishful thinking on our part. Right. Okay. So it's that <clears throat> it's that collision. It's it's sort of having those same characteristics that you would see. Because I know um, with the I mean the big news, you know, in the last year is the discovery of the Higgs boson. And with that one, they went to six sigma. I think it was. So that was like we're sure, sure, right? And so with this five one, sigma is considered a definite detection. Right. And so they're at three sigma with <clears throat> with dark matter. You know what does that you know what does that kind of mean? And you know I know they'll say, well, we're not sure. It means but we need more science. Does that? Yeah, we need more science. We need another bigger detector. But I mean, is that fairly certain? I mean, I'm trying to give that put that in context. Is it done? Have we got dark matter no. now? Can we move on to a new problem? <laughs> but I don't no, mean like you, like you said, there's a, three sigma still leaves a, leaves a significant chance that it is a random event that is masking itself as the dark matter particle. Right. So you need once you're at five sigma, you you can be pretty sure statistically that it's not a random event. So and by to the reach way, that, this... oh, I was just going to say to reach that five sigma, would you just need to keep running the experiment for a longer period of time or more sensitive instruments? Both. Um, <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, I mean, ideally, ideally, all of the above. Well, the other thing too is that this this agrees with. Uh, a, this agrees with a marginal detection from another detector called CREST2, C-R-E-S-S-T, -S -S and don't ask me what that stands for right off the top of my head. What does that but stand it, for off the top of your head? Look, I can hit him in real time. There we go. Uh, yeah, so yeah, you, you, you hit Scott and I'll keep going. Awesome. Um, but anyway, but, the, uh, but it also disagrees with an, the results from another detector called Xenon. So... Mm -hmm. um, so we're really kind of at the, okay, who do we want to believe more? Do we want to believe CDMS more? Do we want to believe Xenon more? Um, I, I am biased in favor of CDMS, but that's just, you know, that I'll admit my human failings, but that's just, you know, that other people are going to be biased more the other way. Um, I'd like to think this is, this is real, but by no means is this a definite detection, and nobody on the CDMS team is going to say that this is a definite detection. Right, and so, um, I mean, I guess I'm just wondering if, if to where this is going to go over the next couple of years. I mean, is it now sort of on the final stretch? Do we, we're just trying to nail down? Because it really felt like for the last few years, we were on the final stretch with the search for the Higgs boson. We had enough you know, instruments going, we had enough preliminary results that, and enough people, enough respectable scientists really saying, okay, I think we're really getting there now. Do you feel like we're sort of in that same sort of final stage of this now, do you think? Another couple of years and we should... A few more years and I think we'll be able to know whether dark matter is a wimp or not. I will say that. Okay. Um, we've got CDMS is, is having an upgrade. Um creatively called super CDMS. Uh, Xenon is having an upgrade. And then there are several other detectors that are going to be coming online. So, uh, and, and others that are having upgrades. So basically, um, basically we're getting the more sensitive detectors you asked about Fraser. It's, yeah. it's really, yeah. it's, it, it, we're going to narrow it down. We're going to be able to say for sure, is dark matter a wimp or is it something else? That is awesome. Yeah, we're coming in on that search space saying that. Yeah. You macho or you to wimp? say it's a wimp, macho but... a wimp. It's and not a macho. It's not, not a macho. macho. <laughs> yeah. If if it is this particle uh, that you know that that now they think they've you know defined some of the parameters. I mean, what does it you know where does that fit into the standard model of physics? Does it have some place 
in the the rest of the discoveries that the people are making like what this is beyond the standard model yeah right this is this is uh this is we, we know that the standard model can't be all there is um dark matter is not part of the standard model it doesn't correspond to you know the particles that make up us or the cousins of the particles that make up us. It's not some so, kind of weird symmetry or supersymmetry? It could be supersymmetry, okay. yes. Um, uh, supersymmetry, though, as the name suggests, is a symmetry. So it doesn't okay. tell us specifically. Okay. It, I mean, it tells us, tells us something about the type of particles we might expect. But it doesn't tell us exactly what their masses should be. It doesn't tell us, you know, it, there, okay, let's put it this way. There are wimps in supersymmetry. Okay. Um, right. And so uh, that's part of the reason why the WIMP regime is one that that we we like to look at. Mm -hmm. So. And the and the other is you know something like the bullet cluster, which uh, Shivan Gupta mentions, yeah. um, which Fraser was referencing, is is uh, these clusters that we've discovered where the uh, the stars have gone through each other, and we expect that, and then the gas is collided and centered in the settle, is centered in the middle, and we expect that. Uh, and the dark matter goes through each other, and that's what we would expect of that particular uh, of some sort of particle like that. You exactly. wouldn't see, uh, you wouldn't necessarily see something else doing that. Trying to recreate that with um, some other physics uh, tends to be problematic. Right. Yeah. Oh, welcome, Nancy Atkinson. Nancy. There's a a bullet cluster image. Yeah. Um, uh, so we're now going to move on to, uh, this is a story that Amy's working on, uh, which is really cool. Uh, the, so the first Soviet rover uh, might have been discovered on Mars. Now, this yeah. is not a recent Soviet rover. No. This is a old... <laughs> Neither is the Soviet Union, so... <laughs> yeah. So what's, so what's the story? Um, okay, so this is, I mean, talk about a, a win for citizen science here. Some Russian... Russian space enthusiasts were looking at old data from NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, pictures taken in 2007, um, and they were looking at a region that was thought that one of the early Soviet Mars missions might have landed in, and they saw what looked distinctly like a parachute, a heat shield, a terminal descent stage, and a lander. And it's way, it's way too early to tell what exactly it is. NASA's taking more pictures, and they have to figure out some modeling stuff um, to see whether or not um, it is indeed the remnants of Mars 3. But if it were the remnants of Mars 3, it would be really, really cool because Mars 3 was an awesome mission that landed successfully and then just died. So <laughs> Mars 3 actually had a twin, uh, Mars 2. They were very creative with their names. Um, <laughs> And they both launched in 1971 in, uh, I'm trying to find the date here, Mars 2 launched on May 19th and Mars 3 on May 21st, and they both reached the red planet in December. Um, Mars, Mars 2 didn't do so well, it entered the atmosphere at too steep an angle and then its parachute didn't deploy and it just smashed. Um, but Mars 3 actually landed, it was the first successful uh, landing on, on Mars, and it had all sorts of science payloads to do atmospheric pressure stuff and wind velocity and chemical composition. I mean, this is before the Viking landers. I mean, this is, we don't know anything about what's happening on Mars or what Mars is really like, which is evident when you look at the tiny little rover that the Soviet Union put into the Mars 3 lander. Um, I don't know if anyone has a picture of it. I should have sent that. Um, but it was I, this, I, From your article, I have one. Do you have one from the article? Because yeah. it was this little boxy thing on skis. I mean, it was totally informed by the fact that <laughs> that Russian winters are, are best uh, navigated with skis. So it was this little box with these little skis that would just kind of do, well, you can't really see it here, I'll do it this way, that would just do one of these to move forward. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this tiny little box, it weighed 10 pounds, it was tethered to the rover by a 50-foot-long umbilical, so it could only go, you know, so far around. It had these little arms on the front of the rover that if it hit something, the arm would kind of press back, and it would signal to the rover to turn and avoid whatever the hazard was, wow. probably a rock. Um, and it was designed to stop every five feet, so the two cameras on the lander could take a picture and see whether or not it was going to go off a cliff or into something <laughs> giant or I mean this is it was the most like rudimentary hazard avoidance system but it's really quite simple and and um didn't I'm amazed at the ingenuity yeah. of these of these old I love missions their stuff. Yes. Yeah. you know like you see some of the original rovers that were that were sent to the moon 
you know, that were rolling around and stuff. I mean, they had figured this stuff out, and some of the missions, yeah. some of the plans for missions that they never even got done. But you, you look at like the Venera spacecraft, the ones that landed that on awesome. on yeah. on Venus. Amazing yeah. stuff. So um, yeah, no, the like Soviets the, were super creative. The Lunacod rovers did something like, like outstripped out, what was it? Opportunities done nearly a marathon, like nearly twenty six miles. Lunacod one did that in like a month and a half. <laughs> it was like, no, we're just going, just gun it. Um, so that's what this tiny little rover was gonna do. It was just gonna sort of like gun it, doing this across the surface and explore things. Um, and it would have been really awesome because it would have been a rover in 1971. Yeah. Except that the, the mission landed, the pedal is just like Curie, or, uh, Spirit and Opportunity did. It sort of landed, and the pedal is open to reveal the science to Mars. And um, a little arm was going to lift up the rover and plop it down so it could start skiing. Um, and then it 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 broadcast data to the Mars through orbiter for 15 whole seconds, and then it just stopped. And no one knows why. And it would be really great if this turns out to, why? <laughs> It'd be great if this turns out to be Mars 3 because it would solve one of those mysteries. There are a couple of, uh, the likeliest thing is a dust storm, but it landed in some crazy dust storm, which was actually violent enough to destroy all its communications, um, hardware and stuff. There's also the chance that, like, something just weird, catastrophic failure with the lander or some communications interruption. I mean, for all we know, the mission could have gone on very, very perfectly. We just didn't have that communications relay between the lander and the spacecraft. So um, we might, we might find out. Um, also, I don't know if Scott, if you have a picture of the first picture. Mars Three did send back the first picture from Mars. <laughs> it is it's a not on your article. Garbled piece of garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but um, there's, but there's been a lot of missions Mars. that people have been looking for. I mean, this is not the first mission they've been searching no. for. They've been, you know, they've lost what the polar lander. There was yeah. Beagle Two. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of missions we, that have I mean, gone missing on Mars too. Like so, so many things. What was the the other NASA one that they got? Polar the lander. Metric? Was it polar lander that the, yeah. Moon, the measurements climate were orbiter? Polar lander. The climate orbiter. That's the yeah. One yeah. One. one um, this one looks probably. like a bad Atari yeah, game. There. Yeah. This, this is the first ever picture sent back from the surface of Mars. <laughs> oh, it's so sad. Yeah. So that, that is sort of the interruption in that is kind of consistent with what they think would have happened in a death storm. But That's when yeah. the big Mars monster... That's, yeah. that's, yeah. Yeah. that's when the big robot... That would be Ether and Ape yeah. Lander. Yeah. That's when Marvin came out with this big ray gun. <laughs> what do they what do they call yeah. that Nancy you might know like what do they call it the the sort of how all the missions to Mars tend to fail and they have like the, the great galactic of, ghoul the, the great galactic, galactic ghoul, ghoul that's right yeah, yeah. that that destroys and, it. and so many if you look through I love looking through the list of the old missions mm -hmm. and you look through all the Soviet ones and it's just failed 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 but smashed they, failed <laughs> they did failed a good job landing. at covering how many failed because if they if it failed in the early stages they would just call it a booster development test <laughs> <laughs> there were i mean you look at you look through those records and there are a lot of proton rocket tests in the late 60s early 70s because they kept losing thrust and their their mars missions never even left earth orbit and they said that's no, really not a interesting it's a booster development test i wonder have oh, you yeah. dug into like what was on that booster development test. Can you get um, that information now? I think, I think most of it is available now. I'd have to go looking, but I think some of them were just like, there, there were planned Mar you know, what happened to Mars 1. I think Mars yeah. 1 was one that was reclassified as a booster development because it didn't actually go anywhere. So, yeah. I mean, presumably it's the same basic spacecraft, lander, orbiter thing and just never... never yeah, but I wonder if there's, there's just a whole bunch of rovers littering the ocean floor and that they just didn't have the, you know, yeah. the guts to to <laughs> announce that they were and... actually sending, you know? I don't, I don't know this if there was another... Rover, not that yeah. one. You know? that was <laughs> I don't know if there were any other rovers except the Mars 2 and 3. To Off the top of my head, those were the yeah. only two rovers, and they both at least got to Mars. So if, if people ever get to Mars, it would be a really neat little Soviet relic to go find. <laughs> yeah. Come on, curiosity, just go find it. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, when you think about the resolution of of the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, it, it wouldn't be that surprising that it would be able to see objects of yeah. that size on the surface. It's just to yeah. know where to look. Yeah, So and so far it looks like they have they can tell based on old data that this is roughly the size of what the heat shield should be, so it's 
it's at yeah. least consistent. But and Hugo uh, Burnham is mentioning in the uh, in the comments that there have been more successful uh, Russian or Soviet missions to Venus than any other planet. And so yeah, yeah. the Russian the yeah. Soviets just absolutely right. nailed uh, mm -hmm. you know that flight <laughs> trajectory. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 It's, well, weird, it's weird. It's weird that they have such a here. disparity between the two. Oh. It shows, it's a family nice. portrait of all these Mars missions, even the one that failed. And That's cute. <laughs> it's like, oh, look at all the dead robots. And yeah. yeah, and so you read some of the stories, some, you know, broke up in Earth orbit, radio failure en route, strand in Earth orbit. Yeah. Fraser, I think you and Pamela did a whole episode about this on Astronomy yeah. Cast. It's yeah, we did. Depressing. <laughs> it's depressing. We, we actually warned people in advance. We're like, this show is going to be really sad. Now we're going to talk about all the failed... Soviet Mars missions and yeah. a couple of failed American Mars missions. Yeah. All right, well, let's yeah. move on. Um, wait, wait, speaking... wait. First, we'll have to do the Amy Shuffle. Amy Shuffle. <laughs> this is good. I just invented a I rover. There's dance. toys. Aren't there wait, toys that, like, that do that, you know, Egyptian or like Martian? they walk, yeah. you know, or they kind of, you know, like Godzilla. So I had one of those in school. Like like this. It was yeah. Donald Duck that did this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's my dad's from the 50s. <laughs> they should follow that mission profile, right? Yeah. You could just walk. Um, okay, so NASA plans to capture an asteroid. This will work out well. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually pretty impressed at this. They're, they're planning to capture an asteroid. Asteroid. How do you feel about that, Fraser? <laughs> I'm for. I'm 100 percent for it. I love it. Yeah, I'm just saying that. Asteroid, put it in a stable, in a stable place around it, and astronauts to actually look at it and, and collect yeah. samples. I think the the sort of saving grace of this mission, the idea is that they would bring an asteroid. I am trying to find in my article what size exactly it is. If anyone knows off the top of their head, throw it out there. But um, the idea is to get an asteroid that if it were to fall through the atmosphere, it would be about equivalent to the Russian meteor from a few, mm. few weeks ago. Yeah, I think so it was it about 20 be, meters. Yeah, it's it's not huge. It's it's big enough to be an object of interest, but if all if it went terribly wrong, it wouldn't destroy the Earth. It would be a, a minor inconvenience to a few hundred people and something awesome to talk about for the rest. With of plenty us. of warning. Yes, with plenty of warning, so everyone could clear Russia. <laughs> right. <'Cause it's laughs> so they like to fall. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. So so what's the what's the mission profile and sort of what's the the background on the story? Nancy, Nancy, did you work on this story at all? Yes, yes, we did. Go so, um, yeah, do you want to sort of give us a, a bit of a background? I know you didn't know you were going to be talking about this, so no, uh, do you remember? Well, I've been listening to the, um, the Planetary Defense uh, Conference this week, and uh, um, so I'm trying to kind of put a, uh, something together of just kind of an overview of what everybody thinks about the whole concept and uh, why this is important for planetary defense and why planetary defense is important and uh, is there a, a real threat out there or is it being kind of um, exaggerated or uh, so it's it's kind of an evolving story and at least on my end anyway I'm trying to put uh, something together but um, yeah, I think it's really interesting. I I think it's kind of cool, and um, uh, the whole concept of um, you know the mission that was talked about of a, a space station being in the um, L was it the L two orbit L one, um, and so I think this is kind of maybe all coming together. Yeah. Uh, if you put a if you put an asteroid there, you got to have a um, you know a spacecraft, or you could put a small space station there. It I don't know. It would I think it would be cool. And I mean, obviously, learning to control the position and orbit of an asteroid is an enormously important uh, skill for the protection of the of the Earth in the future. I mean, it is as we always say, it's not a question of of if; it's just a matter of when another object is going to hit us. And we were reminded by the Chelyabinsk meteor that happened, Chelyabinsk meteor that happened earlier this year, that from time to time, great big chunks of of rock hit. Yeah hit the earth and kill a lot of people and so the sooner we can get on this well, as, skill the better as, as, as a species as, being able to go out and <laughs> capture asteroids and it, just that that skill set like you're saying is something that's huge in advancing just planetary defense saying hey we can go out and relocate things that might cause a bad day uh, <laughs> right. on earth. and as as Rusty Schweikert likes to say you know we have the technology to do it we just haven't tested it out and you, you if you've got something that's dangerous 
and you don't want to be amateur hour at that point. You want to have tried this out and tested it and see if it's actually going to work before you actually really need to use it. And so I think you're mentioning, you know, the L2 Lagrange point, that's one of these positions that are stable around the around the Earth. And so if you could actually slowly maneuver an asteroid into that position, then it wouldn't go anywhere. And then you could come back and you could study, you could send missions to it, you could send humans to it and mine it and tear it apart and hollow it out and you know Yeah, I mean there's just so many concepts here. There's the science concept, there's the technology yeah. concept, there's the technology development, there's the uh you know, or just the skill set that you get from yeah. doing something like that. And it's, you know, it's a place you could go for geology to understand the composition of these things. So it's a, you know, it works on so many levels. I think it's a, yeah, yeah I mean, you know, I was joking at the beginning about, you know, about it not working out well, uh, because it really would. I mean, it would, it would help protect the earth. It would help us understand these objects. It's science. It's right. safety. It's, it's everything. It's awesome. Yeah. So when's it, when is it, when will well, we find out that it won't happen? Uh, well, so from what I've seen, it's 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 a line item in the budget now for to develop the concept, and the most optimistic estimates estimates say 2017 launch. Yeah. At this point, I think it's just a part in the budget, um, which is is a larger story we could we could touch on. Well, these kind of things are always five years out. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, yes, <laughs> or they're thirty see, years out. Yeah. Didn't I see somewhere that they were trying to make this mission? Part of the justification for the SLS system, which would put it in like 2025 launch. Oh, yeah. I, well, I saw that somewhere, and I, I don't don't quote me on that because I can't remember where well, I saw they, that. They but that would send up a human humans to humans. actually look yeah. at it. Yeah. The yeah. Humans, well, well, the humans don't have to capture it, but they would need to still test the rocket and to mm -hmm. then test the technology, and, and that right. would There's be needed at L2. SLS. Yeah, there's an SLS test uh, in 2017 or 18 yeah. that's okay. scheduled. Right. So. But the the sort of the asteroid exploration concept has really heated up in the last couple of you know within the last year, not just from the government having a look at it, but also just all these private firms, right? There's planetary resources. There's the I forget the name of the one that Tom Linson's doing. There's the B612 Foundation. So there are enough private organizations with serious resources that are going to be going down this this pathway as as well. So you know I think we. You know, it's very likely that we'll end up seeing some kind of collaboration between what NASA wants to do and what these private firms are have already. You know, they've got millions of dollars in investment. There's, you know, spacecraft like what's happening with SpaceX. So I think it's a. You know, normally when I hear these things, I just you know prepare myself for the inevitable disappointment when, you know, uh, when it doesn't happen. Oh, uh, Blaze Sanders says, yeah, Deep Space Industries is Rick Tumlinson. So there's like I think like three separate groups that want to to explore and capture and and mine asteroids. So I think we're, you know, this is going to happen now. Whether several, it happens, several places converging on it. Yeah, they're all going to converge. So this is going to happen, and that's not, you know, who knows what's going to happen from the Europeans and what might happen with the Chinese. I mean, this is now, we're moving on this. And we saw what happened with the, the asteroid strike in, in Russia. So, yeah, I, I feel very confident now that something of this is going to happen in the next couple of decades. Right. I don't, I, you know, launch in 2017, that sounds pretty ambitious. That's, yeah. <laughs> um, but I guess, as you mentioned, right, they're, de they're developing the SLS, so the, the need is to use it for something, right? Let's go places. Let's go places, right? And it's... Something it's to do. Something it's to do, cool and it's a pretty beefy launch system, so it's going to have to, you know, they're going to need some big target for it. So that, that kind of makes sense. So maybe I'm talking myself out of my skepticism and humbuggery. <laughs> So, good job. Good uh, um, I wanted to mention that's part of the uh, the larger president budget. Now, if we can touch on that for a few minutes, um, since that came out at the end of last week, um, and this is something that that uh, of course affects us here at CosmoQuest. Um, the uh, what's happening is uh, the budget that's been proposed is to. I know we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks about whether all NASA education funding was going to be canceled, whether everything was being zeroed and whatnot. Um, and the, the story that seems to be coming out is that uh, w they're trying to consolidate all of education funding on the federal level under three agencies. Uh, the Department of Education for formal education, Smithsonian for in informal education, and the National Science Foundation for Education Research. 
Uh, the implication on this for, for NASA education is that it's going to, um, if, if this goes forward, it's going to shut down a lot of the awesome stuff that NASA's been doing, and not just NASA, but agencies like the, uh, the N NOAA. Um, and so where you have content experts actually working on bringing the educational materials to the public, to teachers, I was just at the National Science Teachers Association meeting, and the, the NASA table's been getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and this might be the last year that they're there at all, uh, providing those resources. And so we're uh, just kind of, again, waiting to see how this, how this rolls out, what happens. Um, so like I said, I, you know, the asteroid capture thing was nice, but the rest of the, the education part of the budget is really what I've been focusing on in the last week. Um, and for what that, that means for us at CosmoQuest, of course, is that we're funded by NASA mission funding as well because we do science and we do outreach and we do education. Um, and so it's going to be difficult to um, keep our funding. Our funding sources are going to change, if not right. outright go away. Um, so that yeah, you know, we're definitely going to have to be fluid in, in, in the way that we're looking at our funding and we need to be, you know, need to adapt and try to adapt and overcome to these hurdles that are coming our way. Um, so you know, we, you know, with with all of our uh, our shows, even like this, the Weekly Space Hangout, the Virtual Star Party, um, Learning Space, they're all a part of our, our outreach with CosmoQuest. And so um, we'll put a link out later that if you want to contribute at all to CosmoQuest, um, you go just to cosmoquest.org slash donate. But and you don't you know don't feel like you, you have to financially do it, but even sharing out what we're doing, mm -hmm. and just sharing out on on Twitter and Google Plus and Facebook, you know, spreading out the fact that we are out there trying to get everyone excited and engaged with with space science and astronomy and and just helping understand the universe that we're all a part of. That's you know our real big mission going on and getting everyone involved with that. But you can look forward to, we'll be doing some crowdfunding uh, projects and some fundraising opportunities to keep these projects going and to expand what we're doing. And uh, so look forward to that. I think I can I can more or less officially announce Pamela and I are going to do a 24-hour Google Hangout fundraiser in June, one weekend in June. Uh, <laughs> this is where we get to watch you go crazy on air. Fraser's all kinds of skeptical, <laughs> but I know it's really fun. fun. It's crazy. Yeah. No, I'm in. I'm in. Oh, I just, you know. So we didn't do the full I, 21 hours. I cannot wait to watch you go crazy. We're going to go know, crazy Tune on in air. at the 23-hour mark and watch you, Yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> so do it, Jerry Lewis. Be, so, yeah, we'll be looking. We'll, we'll be inviting some guests in to entertain us and keep us from going completely insane. Uh, but uh, that, that's one thing we have coming up. And like I said, we've got some crowdfunding opportunities to keep our to get our new science projects rolling so you can actually help us do more citizen science. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, look forward to that once we get all the paperwork straightened out. Because <laughs> now all doom and gloom. We we yes. do have a lot of things still planned and going out. It's not you know the sky's not falling. Um, the 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 you know the pocketbook shrinking, but the sky's not falling. We're still excited about doing um, all, just engaging with all of you and doing wonderful citizen science, getting the world involved. Uh, so, so we've got a few minutes left, and Nancy, you had mentioned. Somebody just... doesn't believe we're in the same location. That just... <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Nancy, you mentioned brief. It's a green screen. This is a very clever green screen. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Vance. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, right, Nancy, you you had mentioned sort of here that you there was a story about the International Astronomical Union and uh, Uwingu, and we actually had Alan Stern on from Uwingu here. Uh, a few weeks ago, and mm -hmm. so there's sort of a bit of a kerfuffle going on right now. Did you want to sort of give us a little information on that? <laughs> sure. Uh, um, uh, you know, the Owingu has had their uh, uh, name a planet contest, uh, collecting names for exoplanets, and then they recently started another contest to name uh, Alpha Centauri BB. Uh, that they thought it just needed a little bit better name than that. So um, anyway. Um, uh, the IAU, IAU last Friday issued a statement, and they didn't name a Wingu specifically, but it's it's pretty obvious that's what they were talking about. That they said, um, uh, they know that um, I'm trying to find the their their press release, but anyway, it's that um, that the IAU should act as a single arbiter of the naming process, and and that uh, you can't really buy the name of a planet, and um, 
um, so we talked, uh, I talked to Alan Stern and he just kind of said, um, well, he's always been up front that he didn't really expect the IAU to um, adopt their names or, or to uh, endorse what they're doing, but he just wanted the public to be involved. And he, what the original intent of their exoplanet naming gathering was to provide a baby book of names for um, exoplanet, you know, for um, whatever, who, who's ever going to name an exoplanet that uh, they'd have a, this group of names or list of names to choose from. And the IAU stance so far on um, exoplanet naming is that they, uh, originally their plan was that they were not going to do it because uh, they said there was going to be so many it would be really hard to do. Well, in my mind, you, you know, a Wingo's gathering of names and having them available just fit that bill. Um, you know, it, it solved the IAU's problem. Right. Um, but now the IAU say they are going to um, meet this year and decide whether they're going to do it or not. Now, a, a few uh, things have come out in the midst of this. Um, uh, let's see, Jason Wright, he's an astronomer and a blogger, uh, wrote kind of a scathing uh, blog post about um, that, you know, the IAU really, since they said that they're not going to name exoplanets, that they really have no jurisdiction here. And, uh, and in fact, uh, there was, interestingly, um, uh, people being upset about people naming things. NASA named a, a star system this week. And uh, so uh, they named it uh, UGA-1785, the Kepler-37 star system. And so Alan Stern was wondering if NASA was getting get, going to get in trouble from the IAU. But, uh, um, well, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory renamed a nebula the Manatee Nebula and put out a big press release that we talked about yeah. months ago. Uh, yeah, there's been... <laughs> yeah, there's, there's lots of instances where astronomers or organizations are naming things. And, yeah, um, yeah uh, there is an asteroid named Asteroid Fraser Kane. Right. Exactly. And it's official. Blast out of the sky. Right. Blast out of the sky. Let's, let's harness that asteroid. But the point, right, and so the point being is like, you know, comets, asteroids, they can be named at by the discoverers. Right. While, for example, exoplanets and stars are named by the IAU. I mean, I, I really the think... catalog. A yeah, lot of them right. Named by the cat, the catalog. They are named by the discoverers in the way that it's just the name they're given in the catalog in the publication. Yeah. So, yeah. I, you know, I mean... I, I've, you know, my opinion on this is that I think that if you can get money raised for science, and that science can go to help discover these things, then I think it makes absolute sense that you can, one of the things you can do is, is allow the names to come, to come back to help, to help pay yeah. for the development. I, I, I think I, one thing some people would like to, I know I would like to see is um, the exoplanet scientists weigh in on this. Are they, if they were going to oh. start using these names in their papers, then do it. Um, I yeah, the uh, on that kind of uh, from that of the, side. One of the discoverers of um, Alpha Centauri BB uh, actually made a statement about it, and he was really he said he thought what Owinga was doing was very exciting, oh, okay. and uh, oh. he thought it would be great to have the public involved in the exoplanet naming process. So, yeah. Anyway, it, it um, is our universe. I mean, I, I, yeah. I mean, I just don't think that the IU is doing that any service or doing the you know the science outreach any service by sort of keeping a lockdown on it and keeping the names very you know when you we try to write about pulsars the numbers are super complicated you well, know I, like I understand their statement the when they're saying you know that it's for science and you need to have a very orderly way of I, I get that that make you know you need to be able to understand what you're referencing but that doesn't mean you know I, I, I'm sure I don't go to my car and read the the serial number on my car to know that it's mine you become familiar with it in, in a different way. Yeah. And even though that is the technical designation of my car, there's yeah. technical designations, and then we as humans find ways to relating to other objects. And I think right. that's a great way of... Like in bio, you know, biology has, has the scientific name yeah. and the common yeah. name, and, and nobody seems to be real confused about that. So, and, and there are tons of other astronomical objects that have several names. You know, Polaris, the North Star, and it's got, I don't know what its official designation is. Just go to the NASA Extra Galactic Database or to the Simbad Database and look up your favorite object and see how many names it has. Yeah. <laughs> but there, but I 
I mean, you get this situation, you get this weird dichotomy where scientists are hurting for funds. They're, you know, in many cases, there's very few places that they can go to get money from. NASA, and that's drying up, the National Science Foundation, you know, and then other private foundations like the Sloan and things like that. And yet there are potentially, with the Internet, we can bring together this enthusiasm for science and, in some cases, money and yet there's this disconnect between between that and then the sort of official agency so you know i think that the iu needs to take another think about this and i you know i'm sort of reading jason wright's article and he's sort of he's proposing some modifications to the iu's position on this and i think he's exactly right which is right. you know like let's have another look at it and i think that um that there is what's official and there's what's you know, scientific and, and sort of used in ways to be able to scientists can talk and, and speak in very specific terms about these objects. And then there's what's out in the common, you know, just in just out in the public. And I think that there's a there's a conversation that should be had there. And I and I don't think this is gonna go away. I think the problem was is that some, you know, ten years ago, twenty years ago, you get these name a star people that that right. do no benefit, right? They they right. just they take this catalog of star names, they make this big book, they then sell people the rights and they, they lie and make people think that these 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 are being named after them when really they're not and they're just taking their money. That's awful. And that needs and that needs and I think that has cast a light over the whole just the whole concept in general. But there is a more creative, more balanced solution. Boy, I'm really on the soapbox today. Between <laughs> the uh, between the science with the scientific need and the need for the money and the right. enthusiasm of the public and it helps with the outreach and it's all possible and it just needs people to kind of come together and, and have a conversation about what's the best for science. And I think course, that there's there's you know, also the issue that I mean if it's not going over well, there are other products to sell that could could fill the same right. thing. I mean, if you make instead of spending you know ninety nine cents on naming rights, you could spend it on an app. Even though a, a mobile app game isn't going to do any good in the grand scheme of things, it's going to entertain people. But but I think that if you nope. take you know, I mean, maybe part of it is that it, there's not a real clear lineage from the from the, where the money comes from and then the the objects that are being discovered and how that's being funded, right? But if you go and you gather together on the internet. Ten million dollars for a new telescope. Its only job is to discover extrasolar planets, and then you build that telescope, and then you name the planets off the people that discovered all you know that provided the money to to discover those planets. It's really hard to say, you know, no, we don't want your money because we can't name these planets when you're you're improving the science. So I think, you know, I think that's that's a really hard argument to to make, and 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 you know, scientists will name buildings after people all the time, you know. So anyway. Yeah. Uh, Carolyn Collins Peterson has just uh, put together a really nice overview of what all happened. She's on the Space Writer blog, Space Writer's Ramblings, I think it is. And uh, she just kind of uh, put together what all happened the past couple of weeks. Um, I know you wrote the, about this too, Matthew. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, I think actually we've covered pretty much everything I, I'm willing to say before my article goes live, so I'll uh, I'll stay out of it. But you don't want to give everything away. That way you'll have something to read when it. Well, where it will we out. see it? Where will we see your article? Um, is it is that is that considered good form to tell where something's going to be published before it's published? Okay, it's going to be on the New Yorker blog. Yeah. Um, awesome science blog. Um, no, back for him. We just got you fired. <laughs> <laughs> No way, it's good. You were really in the same They'll room. Love They'll love yeah. it. Everyone, um, go to the New Yorker blog. The New Yorker blog is going to have this great story in a couple of days. Yeah. I highly recommend that you go, subscribe. And I don't know when it's going to Join appear. their mailing list and, uh, and yeah, enjoy that wonderful website. There. Now, there now, we go. Now you're not there we go. You, co you covered me. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Awesome. Um, all right. Well, you know what? I think we've kind of run out of uh, time. Uh, yeah. Even though you've got a TARDIS in the background, we're out of time. We can grab uh, some more if you want. Know. We'll grab some more if that really works. All right, so cool. So why don't we wrap up this weekly space hang this uh, weekly space hangout? Thank you very much, Amy Sure Title. Where do we see more Amy Sure Title? Um, you can go to my website, amysheretitle.com. My blog, Vintage Space, is there. I'm also at Discovery News, Motherboard, Device, and Scientific American, and around the internet. Google Plus is a good one. You are the hardest working journalist in uh, space news. Woo! <laughs> um, uh, I Dr. my eyes to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> so tired. Uh, Dr. Matthew Francis, where do we find out more? 
Um, Apart the, uh, from that wonderful article that's coming out shortly in the yes, New York. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, you can find uh, my, my homepage is at bowlerhatscience.org. There we go. There we go. Um, you can also find, I blog at uh, gallowspendulum.org, and you can also find me regularly at Ars Technica. Twitter is probably the best place to find out everything, all the nonsense I'm up to. I love the Dr. Mr. Dr. Mr. Francis. Yeah. It's my I'm initials, great. really, but that's okay. It looks like no, it's, it's Dr. Dr. Mr. We're all calling Dr. Mr. Of, I know. It makes me think of, of Mr. Mr., though, and then I get Curie Eleison in my head from the <laughs> 80s. So. Um, Nancy Atkinson, my uh, partner in crime over at Universe Today, the other hardest working woman in, uh, in space news. Uh, yep. Nancy, what do you, where do we find more Nancy Atkinson? Nancy is at Universe er, Universe today, and uh, soon coming out with more podcasts for the NASA Lunar Science Institute, and uh, at Nancy underscore A at Twitter. Awesome. And Google and, Plus. And this Scott Gallucci. Gallucci? <laughs> Scott Gallucci. <laughs> Did you just make him my son or something? No, I made a, I no, made no, a, I, you I know, Brangelina. Got married. Yeah. And, um, Lou oh, Scott Wait, Cole. Scalucci. Scalucci. I'm trying to sort of merge you together into some kind of oh, brain. Scalucci the Wonder Twins. Yeah. Wonder Twins. Twins. Scott, Scott Lewis. Where do you find out more Scott Lewis? Uh, everywhere. Uh, I My website's knowthecosmos.com. I am on Twitter at Ball Astronomer, Google Plus, plus Scott Lewis. Um, virtual star parties on Sunday night with Fraser, my co-host. We take over the world and show everyone the, the universe from the telescopes from across the world. And, yeah, um, I do the production for 365 Days of Astronomy and work with Astrosphere New Media and CosmoQuest. Awesome. And, Nicole, where do we find more Nicole? In my house, hanging my out with house. my cardboard TARDIS. Uh, I am Noisy Astronomer. I work for CosmoQuest. Uh, I am the postdoc with the most rock there. She is. Uh, and the website's back up, thanks to this guy Woo! and Corey, our lead programmer, who were sitting on in my living room yesterday, desperately trying to save the website from a DDoS attack. Um, yeah, that's all the news we got going on. Come visit the site, visit our shows. Please do science with us uh, if you can donate, and if not, please just share all the awesome stuff we're doing. And oh, one more, one more, one more thing. Yeah, you can take you can take, you can take a class from me. Mm. Um, uh, check out cosmoquest.org/classes. Uh, we're offering two classes coming up very soon. One's on cosmology, taught by me, and then there's a class coming up in May on stars and star evolution. That's with Ray Sanders, right? Yeah. Um, cool. And so, as Scott mentioned, we're going to, the next big thing we'll be doing on the network is we will be uh, doing our virtual star party. That's on Sunday night. We're going to hook up a whole bunch of telescopes into a live Google Plus Hangout and showcase the night sky. If we're lucky, we should have the moon, Saturn, maybe a little bit of Jupiter, some deep sky objects. So, I think it's going to be great. So, we hopefully. Better weather than we've been getting. Yeah, the weather's been terrible. Who's some buying telescopes heavy, out yeah, there? Some of our heavy hitters has been, have been sort of clouded out and rained out. So. If you have a telescope and are interested in joining the virtual star party, you should uh, contact this guy or that guy, <laughs> uh, and they can help you out yes. with uh, how, to, how to do the setup, and you can actually join with uh, a larger pool, a more geographically diverse pool. Maybe we can thwart the weather from now on. Uh, thank you, Brian Consell. Yes, it is portmanteau. And Scoglucci is a portmanteau, which is Thank you, Ryan. You mush two <laughs> words together. Uh, awesome. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks, everyone, for joining. It was great, and we'll see you all next week here on the Weekly Space Hangout. Bye, Bye everyone.